When the universe began, there were no elements, just energy. A few millionths of a second after the Big Bang, quarks condensed into the first protons, neutrons and their antiparticles. By the time the universe was a second old, its diameter had grown to about 20 light years and its newly formed electrons and positrons had started annihilating one another. Fortunately, a slight imbalance left the universe with an excess of familiar particles after their antiparticles were eliminated. There were now equal numbers of protons and electrons and about six times as many protons as neutrons. A proton is a hydrogen nucleus, so the lightest atomic nucleus was present in the universe's first microseconds. Within a couple of minutes, the growing universe had cooled and the conditions were right for protons and neutrons to assemble into the next two element nuclei. These were helium and a tiny amount of lithium. The universe cooled so rapidly that the window in which nuclear fusion was viable lasted only for about 20 minutes. There was no time for elements heavier than lithium to assemble, although it's likely that very small numbers of beryllium and boron nuclei formed. For every 12 hydrogens, there was one helium. For every billion hydrogens, there was one lithium. There were no true atoms yet. The universe was too hot. There was a plasma of disconnected nuclei and electrons. It took the universe a little over 130,000 years of growing and cooling before the first complete atoms formed. These were helium atoms. At this stage, the universe's first molecular bond could also have formed in the shape of helium-2 plus molecules. If they formed, these molecules would have been very short-lived. The universe's mixture of helium atoms and protons allowed the first compound to form in the shape of helium hydride. So, the universe's first compound was a positively charged, extremely powerful acid. Protons and electrons completed their coupling to form neutral hydrogen atoms when the universe was about 380,000 years old. With the disappearance of free electrons, the universe became transparent to light. This is the earliest light telescopes can detect, the cosmic background radiation. The three lightest elements are now present. What about the rest? For the rest, we need time, lots of time. Time for hydrogen and helium atoms to be brought together by gravity to form the first stars, the furnaces that forge the elements. The first stars formed when the universe was a hundred million years old. Time for stars to burn through much of their hydrogen fuel, converting it to helium by nuclear fusion. Time for stars to start burning helium. In the universe's very first massive stars, this started in just a few million years. Sometime and somewhere in the early universe, a massive star became the first to burn helium nuclei as fuel, fusing them together to make the universe's first carbon. The reaction is called the triple alpha process, a famous and bizarrely unlikely reaction. The process takes its name from the three alpha particles it assembles to make carbon. Adding a further helium nucleus to carbon makes oxygen. This was the start of stellar nucleosynthesis, the building of the chemical elements from lighter elements. The exact course of nucleosynthesis and the elements it makes depend on a star's properties such as mass, rotation rate and starting composition. In the final stages of nucleosynthesis, the volume in which burning takes place is about the size of the Earth. The hydrogen envelope around the zone of element production is enormous. Our own sun would swell as far as or even beyond Jupiter's orbit if it had an envelope the size of a final stage massive star. Elements up to zinc can be made by fusing helium nuclei with the nuclei of other elements in a massive star's core. These reactions produce many of the most familiar and abundant elements, including the four that in addition to hydrogen make DNA the basis of all life. The isotopes of elements made by fusion that are heavier than iron are radioactive. For example, zinc-60, made in very small amounts by fusion of nickel-56 with helium-4, has too many protons relative to neutrons to be stable. Zinc-60's half-life is about two and a half minutes. It decays to copper-60, which has a half-life of about 24 minutes, and copper-60 decays into nickel-60, which is stable. Similarly, iron's most abundant isotope, iron-56, is made from fusion-sourced nickel-56. Nickel-56 decays to Cobalt-56, which decays to Iron-56. The elements heavier than the iron group need to go beyond fusion. Here's why. 
we'll draw a horizontal axis showing the number of nucleons in a nucleus. On the vertical, we'll plot the average binding energy between the nucleons, zeros at the top. As nuclei fuse, potential energy is liberated and a star like our own shines. When we get to the region with nucleon numbers of 56 to 62, we run out of nuclear potential energy. From heavier elements, we can release energy by splitting the nuclei to produce nuclei with lower potential energy. To create heavier nuclei, we need an input of energy and mass. The input is neutron capture and it happens in stars nearing or at the end of their lives. Neutron capture takes place in two ways. The slow or S process, which takes place on timescales of thousands of years in environments where the concentration of free neutrons is relatively low. The rapid process, which is over in the blink of an eye and takes place where the concentration of free neutrons is very high. Each process accounts for about half of the nuclei made by neutron capture. Although neutron capture produces more elements than fusion, the abundances of neutron capture formed elements are lower. The graph here is logarithmic and we need to be careful how we read it. There are about 40,000 hydrogen atoms for every iron atom. There are over 4 million iron atoms for every gold atom. Here's an example of the S process. A nucleus captures a neutron. Here the neutron's captured by element 28, nickel. The newly formed heavier nickel isotope emits a beta particle, converting a neutron to a proton to become copper, element 29. That's a typical S process synthesis. It takes place in stars of about 0.6 to 10 solar masses nearing the end of their lives, when they are classified as AGB stars. In the S process, nuclei capture one or more neutrons. In this example, we begin with stable iron 56. By successive neutron captures, it becomes iron 59, which is unstable with a half-life of 45 days. The iron 59 emits a beta particle, converts a neutron to a proton and becomes cobalt 59. Cobalt 59 captures a neutron to become cobalt 60, which is unstable with half-life 5.3 years. It decays to nickel 60 by emitting a beta particle. Neutron absorptions and beta decays continue. With time, the S process forms nuclei as heavy as element 83, bismuth. Any polonium, element 84, that may be produced quickly decays to lead. The S process tends to produce lighter isotopes. S process stars cast off layers in stellar winds and as planetary nebulae. The material cast off produces cosmic dust rich in elements and organic compounds which end up in new stars and their solar systems. Then there's the rapid or R process. This process makes about half of the nuclei heavier than iron. It makes the radioactive elements heavier than bismuth that reach us on Earth, thorium and uranium. It can make very heavy nuclei, but these nuclei are often too short-lived to have made it to Earth from the stars. The R process needs explosive conditions with a high density of neutrons, such as those found in colliding neutron stars or in supernovas. In these events, it only takes about a second for the neutron burst to synthesize about half of the universe's nuclei heavier than iron. The R process makes neutron-rich heavy isotopes. In fact, isotopes of any particular element are often made by both the slow and rapid paths. We can plot graphs comparing the nuclei produced by the slow and rapid processes. The lightest isotopes tend to be made by the slow process. The very highest weight isotopes are made by the explosive rapid process. Looking at the periodic table again shows we still haven't accounted for elements 4 and 5, beryllium and boron. These rather fragile elements are actually destroyed in stars. For example, we've already seen how the triple alpha process makes, but then removes, beryllium. Along with most of the universe's lithium, beryllium and boron are formed when cosmic rays split larger nuclei. Here's a carbon colliding with a proton, a cosmic ray. Cosmic rays have very high energy and are emitted by supernovas, for example. One of the fragments of the collision is boron. Two protons also fly off. The technical term for this fragmentation is cosmic ray spallation. 
The abundance of the elements produced by spallation is considerably lower than the other low-mass elements. Some naturally occurring rarer, heavier nuclei can't be explained by any of the processes I've mentioned so far. They're made by the P process, producing proton-rich nuclei. The P process is less well understood than the others. In some cases, it may involve proton capture. In others, it's most likely photodisintegration of nuclei. There are elements we find on Earth that didn't reach us from the stars. Technetium, promethium, polonium, astatine, radon, francium, radium, actinium and protactinium are made in radioactive decay chains that begin with thorium or uranium. Some of these elements are present in truly minuscule quantities. At any moment there's less than a gram of natural astatine on our planet. Tiny amounts of natural neptunium and plutonium are made by uranium-238, capturing a neutron followed by beta decay. Thorium and uranium have half-lives of billions of years and, as we saw earlier, are produced by the R process. Both were present in the material that made our planet when the solar system formed. Since then, they've been slowly decaying. Their nuclear reactions have resulted in the natural presence of several radioactive elements, some in very small quantities, on Earth. Now we look at the elements we encounter on Earth that haven't arrived here naturally. These elements needed most time of all to form, time for a technological civilization to appear. Some of them, like elements 99 and 100, Einsteinium and Fermium, were found in the fallout from nuclear weapons. They were made by the R process. Others have been made by bombarding one atomic nucleus with another in particle accelerators to produce new, heavier nuclei. These are generally highly unstable. For example, one of the recent additions to the periodic table, element 118, Oganesson, is so unstable that after it's been formed, 98% of it has disappeared in the time it takes for a bee's wings to flap, once. Only five atoms of this element have been detected so far. Before we get too carried away by human ingenuity, we should bear in mind that some so-called synthetic elements like curium can be created naturally in the stars. It's just that they're too unstable to survive long enough to make it to Earth. Technetium was once regarded as a synthetic element. Its synthesis and analysis on Earth allowed its spectroscopic fingerprint to be detected in red giant stars. A decade later, it was found at about 0.2 parts per trillion in uranium minerals. So, Earth's chemical elements have seven principal sources. The Big Bang, nuclear fusion, neutron capture, cosmic ray spallation, the P process, radioactivity of uranium and thorium, and our very own actions. It's well known, but worth reminding ourselves that almost the entire mass of our planet and all its life forms are made of atoms created billions of years ago in stars.